it's been a rough week, but thank God we're here. Yes, man. You may have lost some power, but thank God that you have power to lose. <laughs> it's coming back on, in other words. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God has been good to us. Yes, yes. And I appreciate you making it out to church after a week like our city has had, and really it's been the last three weeks. Two major hurricanes right. <laughs> in uh, a three-week span. Right. Uh, that's, that's uh, yeah, that's rough. But I know that on the, uh, on the other side, there's glory. Amen? Amen? And so I'm glad you're here today. I'm excited. Um, I know that you guys are excited about this series. How many of you are enjoying Amen. our series? Yes. Amen. You're, you're learning? Yes. yes. Amen. Well, I know you want to get further. I know you want to keep going. Yes. Uh, Birdie told me that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, but I'm, I'm very thankful for all of you. I, I want to say this. Uh, thank you so much for uh, letting me be your pastor. Thank you for giving me the privilege of pastoring you, your family, your children, uh, with all of my heart, I know you don't see Annie. I speak for her. She's always, you know, in the back taking care of her kids. But uh, I can guarantee that the sentiment is the same, that, that uh, I speak for both of us. Um, we love you deeply and dearly. Uh, not only those who are here, but those who are uh, watching online. We have a lot of members in the New York, New Jersey area, uh, in, the tech, in the Dallas, Texas area, and other places throughout the country. Uh, because some of you have come from different places. Yeah. You know, Davida has spread the word back home in her home state of Maryland. And uh, your mom, I saw your mom, she's in Pittsburgh, you know, she's a milestone follower and she watches <laughs> us. And, uh, and, and I'm very conscious also, I speak to our online audience, I'm very conscious and aware that uh, we're not where we are today after two back-to-back -back storms just because of our prayers. But we thank you for all of your prayers yeah. and your love for us down here uh, in the Tampa area. So we say thank you, don't we church? Yes. Yes. Amen, thank yes. you so much, amen. So I, so I love you guys, thank you for letting me pastor you, thank you for letting me uh, share the word with you every Sunday. Thank you for trusting us with your family, uh, your children, uh, and, and I pray that you are uh, getting blessed because you're uh, here, amen? amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, so let's get into it this morning. I'm, I'm excited. Let's start off with our uh, Bible confession. Hold your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, uh, whatever it is you use for the Word of God. And just repeat after me. I want to say welcome to all of our first-time visitors. Thank you so much. Is this your first time here? Amen. Thank you. How would you hear about us? Well, I've seen you before. Yeah, I thought so. I thought, I know, I know. I know. Yeah, well, thank you for visiting and thank you for being here. Amen. 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 Good to see you guys. All right, repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am, I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better. After hearing the word of faith, faith comes by hearing, by hearing and hearing and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, the, hearing the Word of God. We're in a series entitled The Believer's Authority, and we've been on this series now for six weeks. This is our seventh week in this series. And so far, we basically uh, have tried to establish two main foundational points. The first being that God has given to mankind authority. Whether you are a Christian or not, a believer or not, God has delegated authority over the earth to human beings, Genesis 1:26. And so when God delegated authority to human beings, in a sense, and please hear me on this point, he limited his own authority and power because he gave us authority. I am not saying that God does not have power or authority. I do believe that God is all powerful. Yeah. I do believe that God is uh, numero uno. However, 
God has given us authority and because he respects our authority so much, he will not violate our free will, our right to choose. He will not violate our authority. And the church said, amen. amen. And so it's wrong for us to blame God for all of the things that happen in the earth because God is not responsible for what is happening when it's negative Amen. because he gave authority to us. People say things all the time such as, well, why did God let this happen? How many of us have had those thoughts? Yes. Every one of us. Yes. We say things uh, such as uh, God could have kept this from happening if he wanted to. How many times have we had that thought? And you may still think those, those things, but hopefully through this series, you're beginning to chip away at some of that uh, era, it's not God letting uh, or, or causing things to happen. God gave us authority and we have to rise up, cooperate with God, submit to him, resist the devil, hmm. and then we'll see God's plan come to pass in our lives. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, now, after we established that point, the next point that we set out to establish was that now, because God has given authority, now you have to understand that as a believer, you have supernatural power and authority. I want you to say this with me. Say, I am a believer. I am a believer. And because I am a believer, I have supernatural power and authority. Now that's where we started last week. We began to show you, quote unquote, the believer's authority, yes. the believer's authority. Yes. Now, because you are a believer, you have been vested with supernatural power and authority to deal with all that the enemy would try to bring against you. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes. All right, let's look at Luke chapter nine. Luke chapter nine. <clears throat> and I want you to look with me at verse one. <clears throat> Luke 9 and verse 1. I'm reading out of the King James. When you have it, we have some seats up here, full row of seats up here, and there's a whole row that's here. Mm -hmm. yep. Amen. And we ate breakfast this morning, <laughs> so you safe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Luke chapter 9. Now let's look at the supernatural power and authority that has been given to us as believers. Then he called his 12 disciples together. Is everybody there in Luke 9? Yes. All right, then he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them two things. Number one, power. Number two, what is it, church? Authority. authority. What is authority? The right to use his power. Okay, so he called his disciples together and he gave them power and authority. Now, the Bible tells us in John chapter 6, excuse me, John chapter 8, verse 31. He says, if you are a believer, you are a disciple. Yes. So yes, he's talking to the 12 disciples here. But if you are a believer, how many believers do we have in the house? Put your hand up high. Amen. If you are a believer, listen to me, you are a disciple. And now that you are a believer, you also have authority. This yes. is the believer's authority. And what is this power and authority over? Look at this. He's given us power and authority over all devils. So you have power over Satan. Hallelujah. You have power over all devils. Hallelujah. There is nothing that the devil can do to you that is more powerful than the power Jesus gave you. There's nothing that the enemy can do to you that can hurt you. I didn't get to any amens on that. I heard one amen. Let me show it to you. Flip over. Go to chapter 10. What can you do with this power and authority? Go to Luke chapter 10 and look at what he says here. He said, look at verse. Look at verse 17, Luke chapter 10 and verse 17. And the 70 returned again with joy. So we didn't read the beginning of chapter 10, but chapter 10, verse one says he appointed another 70. So he had originally how many disciples? Twelve. Twelve. We all know that. And then he added another 70 
So it was 82 total disciples. Mm. So 70 returned and notice what they said. Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through your name, through your name. Now watch this. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Mm -hmm. In other words, Jesus said, I saw him fall. Yeah. I know that he has no power. Hmm. If someone falls from their position, that means they lose all the power and authority that they had with that position. Right. Somebody shout, the devil's been demoted. The devil's been demoted. And you've been promoted. And I've been promoted. Amen. Amen. And so he said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Now watch this. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. How much authority and power do you have over the enemy? All. All. Yes. Hallelujah. All. Hallelujah. There is nothing the devil yes. can do yes. to hurt you. There's nothing that there. Let me say it this way. There is no sickness or disease because sickness and disease comes from Satan, not God. There is no sickness or disease that the devil can produce that can hurt you. Amen. There is no problem that he can bring across your life that can hurt you. Look at look at what Jesus goes on to say. Look at this. He says, and nothing shall by in any means what? Hurt you. Nothing shall by in any means what? Hurt How many things shall not hurt you? Now, do you believe that? Yes. Now, don't worry, you might not believe it. You might see sometimes you can see something, but it doesn't mean you believe it. Amen. See, it's just mental. You, you, you acknowledge it's there, what we would call mental assent. Right. You can agree with me that, Pastor, yes, I see that the verse is there. But faith comes by what? Hearing. Yes. You've got to stay with it to believe yes. that this is really true for you. Yes. When you get to the place that you have confidence in what God is saying to you, you'll put the devil on the run. Amen. But, but it takes time. You don't just step from where you are today to there. Yeah, yeah. But that's why you keep coming week after week. You keep getting it. What's happening? It's getting deeper and deeper. Your mind is being renewed and renewed. You're beginning to see who you are and what you have in Christ. Yeah. Amen. Somebody shout, I am a believer. I am a believer. And, I and I have authority. And because, and because I, have authority. I, have authority. I have authority and power, and power. there is nothing. There Absolutely nothing. Absolutely the enemy can do. Sickness is an enemy. Poverty is an enemy. Addictions are enemies. There is no enemy that can hurt me or my family. Through this power, Jesus gave me. Now that's the truth about it. That's the truth about it. You know, sometimes what's good for you when you're in a difficult situation, say that. Why? Because faith comes how? Didn't say who you had to hear it from. In fact, you will believe you quicker than you'll believe me. Because you hear yourself with your inner ear. You hear me with your outer ear. You follow me? See, your inner ear is more real than anything. Your inner ear is how you process information. That's why you get dizzy when you're on a roller coaster. <laughs> Did you know that? Yes. Because your inner ear is telling you, well, we're still. <laughs> right. I'm in a roller coaster. I'm not moving. Yet your eyes see everything blazing by you. <laughs> so your inner ear gets confused with the outside. Mm -hmm. And what happens? Confusion, dizziness. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Now, you have power and authority. Now, let me, we, we began to talk about this last week, and I want to say this here. There's one thing to know that you have power and authority over all the enemy. Mm. And there's another thing to know how to use that power. That's right. Those are two different things. They are not one in the same. Now, I am going to teach you how to use your power, or I should say his power, because it's delegated authority. Yeah. If we were to screw a light bulb into your mouth, it would not come on. You are not the source of any power. It is delegated. It is his power and his authority, but it is under your authority, meaning you have to use it. He's not going to use it for you. Are you with me? Okay, now, 
It's one thing to know that I have power and authority. It's another thing to know how to use it. So I'm going to teach you that starting next Sunday. Because, no, and I'm, jo I'm not joking, <laughs> because I have to lay down a piece of the puzzle, which is vital. Now, let me say this to you. This, this believer's authority, you don't get this information just like that. Okay. You have to absorb this because you have not been trained to believe this. You've been trained to believe whatever God wants to happen will happen regardless of me. Yes. That's right, that's right. Would, how many people would agree yes. with that? Yes. 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 So I just kind of float along in case Sarah. Sarah, whatever will be, will be. The world calls it what? Faith. The church calls it sovereignty of God. You know, we got to get all, you know, high tech and everything, you know, <laughs> sovereignty. But the church, the world just says faith. Whatever will be, will be. That's not true. Life does not happen to you. Life is coming from you. Out of your heart flow the issues of life. Proverbs 420. It's coming from you. Amen. Amen. OK, now here's what we got to cover this morning. This is a very, very crucial piece before we talk about how to use your power and authority, because you will not be motivated to use your power and delegated authority unless you get this major piece of the puzzle. Okay. And here's what I want to talk about this morning. And, and please don't skip to next week. You know, in sports, there's something called uh, how many sports fans do I have in the house? Put your hand up. OK, we have sport, sports fans. OK, now. I could have been a first round draft pick as a cornerback, but I chose to go into the ministry. OK, <laughs> now, if you believe that I have a bridge, I'd like to sell you somewhere. Amen. <laughs> All right. Now, now, here's the thing. This piece is vital. It's vital information. What I'm going to tell you here now, here's what I need you to get. With. Authority. Comes responsibility. And if you don't under, see, my sister said, that's good. <laughs> she said, <laughs> she made the cross. <laughs> now, listen, with authority comes responsibility. In other words, when God delegates authority to you, now, please, you have, if, 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 Nothing. Don't jump to next week. I was going to make the point about sports. I, you, we asked you about how many sports fans. In, in football, there's something called a trap week. Does anyone know what that is? A trap week? Well, we know you know, Bill, what that is. All right. We don't, <laughs> all right. I, Bill's like, I don't know any of the Bible questions, but I do know this one. <laughs> all right. Now, watch this. There's something called a trap week. Now, a trap week in football is, is simple. What it means is you're facing someone that week that's like the Giants. They're, they're trash. <laughs> Right. They're trash. They're not a good team. Now, next week, you're playing a premier team, someone in your division. Maybe their first place. They're 10 and two. You got to get this game to continue your playoff. It's a big, important game. Now, this week, it doesn't matter. So what's human nature? You let down. Right. You play up to competition. You play what? Down to a lesser opponent. So a trap week in sports is. Your mind is already on next week, the Monday night game. So you playing the Cleveland Browns and Deshaun Watson this week, who cares about them? So you, you played that. If there's any Cleveland Brown fans in here, my apologies. No, All right. Amen. It is fine. Right? She's a Steeler fan, so those are her enemies. All right. So, so, so you play down. You don't pay attention that week. You come in, you're sluggish. You do your walkthroughs with, without intensity. You don't really care. What happens? You go in there, they beat the brakes off of you. Yeah. A team that's garbage, mm -hmm. they beat the brakes off you. Why? Because you let down. Yeah. So please hear me. Don't let this week be a trap week. Okay. Yeah. And now you start thinking, well, I just need pastor to show me how to use his power and authority. Listen to me. If you don't get this Cleveland Brown game down, <laughs> you're not going to even understand next week because you won't have the motivation and the, the, the fortitude to stick with it. Because if you believe that God just will do it and I have no responsibility, then you won't really press in to learn how to use your power and authority. Is everyone with me? Yes. Because when you start using your power and authority, it may not happen immediately. 
You speak to the mountain, the mountain got bigger. It didn't go into the sea. You told the sickness to leave. Next thing you know, your left elbow started hurting. You follow me? Because the devil's trying to push back on you. He's trying to make you believe that it doesn't work, that you don't have power over me. You don't have authority. So it's like, you know, you, he's trying to make you, you know, he's jumping at you, trying to make you bluff. You follow me? Yes. So, so just pay attention to this week. We're going to be quick. I won't hold you long. I know you don't believe that, but I'm, I'm, I'm honest. Okay. Now, yeah, two examples today. Two examples. Now, good job, Connor. Connor's remembering. Amen. All right. Now, so here we go. So, 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 so I want you to say this with me. Here's today's message. Say with authority, with authority comes, comes responsibility. responsibility. All right. Now, let's talk about this. When God tells you to do something, he is not going to do what he told you to do. He is not going to do it. If God tells you to do something, mm -hmm. he is not going to do what he has given you the authority of doing. Right. Now go to Mark 16. Let me show you. This is where we left off last week. And then I'm going to go straight into these two examples with you. Mark 16. And we're going to look at verse 15. When you have it, say, I have it. All right, Mark 16, and look at verse 15. I'm in the King James. All right, now notice this. And he said unto them, everybody there? Yes. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do what? Preach, preach the gospel. He told them to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. And these signs will follow the believer. In my name, they will cast out devils, speak with new tongues, take up serpents, meaning control the enemy. And if they drink any deadly thing, what's going to happen? It won't hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick. And what's going to happen to the sick when a believer lays their hands on them? They will recover. Start practicing that. Lay hands on your kids when they get a fever. Lay hands on yourself when pain comes on your body. Before you jump to the Tylenol, I'm not telling you stop taking your medicine or any of that. I'm just saying before you take a Tylenol, speak to the headache. Then take a Tylenol, that's fine. But start implementing faith. Lay your hands on yourself. And I, I'm going to show you how to use your authority. This next week I'll show you what to say and how to do it. OK, now let's keep going. So he says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Verse 19. So then after the Lord spoke to them. He was received up to heaven. And what did he do? He sat down. So he gave them authority and power, told them to go out and get the job done. And what did he do? He sat down. He sat down. Listen to me. The Lord is still seated today. If the ones who he gave power and authority to don't go, they will never see God's power work through them. God is seated. He does not work without you. When he told you to do something, you can't now turn back to God and say you do it. He's seated. He told you to go and to get busy, to occupy till he comes. Now look at the next verse. And they went forth. And they what? Preached. Of course, they did all the other things that follow preaching. But he's focusing on that. And I'm going to use that in his, as an example for a second. But they went and preached. Now look at what happened when they went. Read the next clause of this sentence. The Lord working what? So when did the Lord's power start working? When they went. When they took their place, rose up, and they began to use their power and their authority, they preached. They began to do what God, what, told them to do. He told them, go and preach. When they began doing what he told them to do, they started seeing God's power, what, work. Listen to me. This is vitally important that you get this. If you are not doing what God told you to do, you will not see the power of God work. Mm. My God. Amen. 
All right, let me make an application here so that this will hit you square in the chest. <laughs> you're in Mark, real, you're in Mark, okay? Um, you don't even have to, we don't even have to flip back here. But we read this last week. He told them, he said, I want you to go and, actually, I want you to see this. First, look at Mark real quick. I want you to see something because I need to make a very, very important application. Look at verse 18. They will take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will do what? Amen. They will do what? Amen. Who's the understood subject? The believer. Yeah. They will do it. They will lay hands on the sick. And what's going to happen to the sick when the believer lays hands? Okay, did he say to pray and ask me to heal the sick? Now, put away your religious doctrine, please. Put away your sacred cow. If you don't, I'll kill it for you. <laughs> put them away. I'm reading to you the B-I-B-L-E. These are words in red. These are not my words. This is the Bible. Nowhere in here do you see my name or the Freedom Center. He told them, they, you, are the understood subject, the believer. These signs will follow them that what? Believe. He's talking to who? The believer. He told the believer, lay hands on the sick and they will recover, correct? Yes. Did he tell you to pray for the sick? No. No. I'm asking you a question. Did he tell you to pray for the sick? No, no. All right, let's go look at another. Let's go back here. Go to, go to, go to Luke. Go back to Luke 9. All right, now watch this. Luke 9, and look at verse 1. Then he called his twelve. We read this already. We're going to read it again. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure all diseases. Is there such thing as an incurable disease? Well, yes, in the natural. In the natural there is, but not for a believer who knows how to use their authority. It's quiet in this Presbyterian church. See, I got to get you to believe who you are and what you have. We're settling for far too. We're living way beneath our rights and privileges. Amen. Do you know what it means when you say you are the righteousness of God? Now, you became righteous when you put your faith in Jesus. It's not through your works. When you became the righteousness of God, you know what that means? It means that you have a right to something. Amen. And you have a right to life and life more abundantly. You have a right to all the blessings of God. He is telling you that you will be able to cure any disease. There is no disease that is incurable. Now, the medical industry may not have figured it out, but that's why you're here. Are you with me? All right, now watch this. Here's why I took you here. Look at verse 2. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to what? Heal. And to what? Heal. And to what? Heal. It does not say pray for the sick. He did not tell you to go pray for the sick. Now, I'm trying to make an application here because when I show you what I'm going to show you, unless I lay this down, you won't, you'll keep, Here's what Christians do. If they see someone sick or they're dealing with sickness. Let's say you have a loved one who's sick. What do we do? Pray. We pray. We ask God to what? Yeah. Do they get healed? You don't have to answer. I already know. You know why they don't? Because you are doing what he told you not to do. He never told you to pray and ask him to heal the sick. He never told you to do that. And if you don't understand this concept, with authority comes responsibility. Yeah. If you don't understand that the moment he gave you the ability to do something, you now have to respond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to have response ability. You now have the ability to respond to any situation with the power and authority he gave you. Yeah. 
And if you are taking your authority and pushing it back to God and saying, oh, God, I am nothing. I can do nothing. Would you please heal my dear Aunt Susie? Aunt Susie is going to die. <laughs> because he did not tell you to do. He said they lay hands on the sick. Yeah. He did not tell you to ask me to heal the sick. The church told you that. Jesus, the head of the church, did not tell you to do that. He said, I've given you power and authority. Now you go and heal them. It's not your power, but it is under your authority. It's under your authority, meaning you have to use it. Yes. And if you are pushing off to God what he told you to do, this is why nothing happens in our lives as Christians, because we are misinformed. We are coming to God and we are when we should be using our authority, we're praying. Hmm. Prayer is not a place for you to beg and ask God for anything. Come by here, my Lord. Come by here. He's already here. He's waiting on you to what? Go. Preach. Lay hands. Speak to the devil. When you go, the Lord worked with them. You want to see God's power work in your life? You got to start doing what he told you to do. That's where we're missing it. He did not tell you, you will not see the power of God asking God to heal a person that's sick because he did not tell you to do that. He seated. He told you, lay hands on them, get them healed. And when you lay hand, his power will start to what? Work. Now, let me show you some examples. And then I'm done. I'll let you out of here. You, if you don't like me, you say, this boy preaching heresy. I lay my results against your results any day. And if your results can match my results, then we can talk. If not, you need to listen to me. Amen. How many people have you seen healed? How many paralyzed people have you seen get up 30 years paralyzed? How many sick people, how many people with the COVID did you see healed instant, in 24 hours? How many, how many people with vision problems who the doctor told them that this is in incorrectable, it cannot be fixed, and you've seen their eyes? How many people have that happened to you? You need to listen to what I'm telling you. Amen. You are doing things that he told you not to do. And then you're wondering, where's God? So the only thing left is to say, well, God is mysterious. Sometimes he will and sometimes he won't. We never can tell what God will do. That's, that's a lie. God will always do what he says he'll do when you start doing what he told you to do. Amen. He told you to do something and you have to do it. It is not for you to look to God to do something that he gave you the responsibility of doing. Now, it's not you producing it. Please hear what I'm saying. Does everyone understand that it's not your power? It's, you're not the source, but it's, you have to, you have to, to go. Yes. You have to, it's under your authority. He, yes. he gave it to you. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, now, let's go show you some examples. Let's use... Let, before I show you this example, let's let's use salvation. Okay. How many of you would agree that salvation is the creme de la creme with God? It's the most important thing to God. Yes. Yes. Some of you are like, no, it, it, I, I'm not sure. I'm going to ask again. How many of you believe that sal your eternal yes. destination yes. Yes. is the most yes. in, whether you got healed of cancer That's right. a million years from now or not? You're not going to think care whether you got healed of cancer when you're on streets of gold and you're living with God you're not going to care whether your marriage got restored or if Frank ever started acting right you don't care would everyone agree with that you're not going to care whether you got your fifth flat screen tv a, a, a million years from now would you agree with that yes. so the most important thing to God is your eternal security would you agree yes. okay now how did God, the, the first thing he told the disciples to do before he told them to heal, before he told them to deal with the devil, it's the first thing he said, go preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So that's the number one. That's his priority. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay, now. 
When God tells you to preach the gospel, you can. God is not going to do it. God is not showing up this morning here on Sunday in the Freedom Center preaching the gospel. He's not going to go to your child, your loved one, your son who's wayward. He's not going to go to your neighbor who doesn't know him and preach the gospel to him. God is not going to do it. Why? Because he's seated. He told you to go. Now, if you can get the concept of salvation, then you can understand everything that's underneath salvation. Would you agree healing is under salvation? Would you agree prosperity is uh, uh, beneath salvation? Yes. So however God handles the most important thing to him is how he will handle everything else. Would you agree? Yes. If I can jump 10 feet, you would be a smart person to bet I can jump 5 feet. Correct. Because 10 is, is greater, right? Correct. Salvation is the greatest thing. Yes. I'm going to show you now an example. Where he, he already gave them the, the command, go and preach the gospel. When he d told you to do that, he's not going to do it. It's the same with healing. When he told you to heal the sick, you cannot come back to God and say, God, heal this person. You, whether you call it prayer or begging, whether you fast for two weeks, whether you make a prayer chain, whether you make Facebook posts, I don't care how you, how you package it, you cannot shut that back off on God. Any more than you can shut back on God, the preaching of the gospel. He's not going to do it. So I'm going to show you an example of a man who God appeared to this man in his house, sent an angel, mm -hmm. appears to this man in his house. He wants the man to be saved, mm -hmm. tells the man to send for a man, Peter. Right. It takes four days mm -hmm. before Peter comes back. A lot could happen in four days. Yeah. You could die. You could get hit by a car. You could drown. Why didn't God, he's, he's standing in the man's house. Why didn't God, why didn't that angel preach the gospel to that man? Because God placed it under your authority. When he tells you to do something, he's not going to do what he told you to do. When he told you to heal, you cannot get down fast for two weeks, call everybody up on Facebook, call all your family members and say, pray for us. All right, let me say this. It's not wrong to pray, but that's next week. Let me say it like this. It's not wrong to pray, but after you pray, you got to do something. All right, but that, I'm, I'm saying it a certain way because I'm literally trying to, I want this sacred cow to be killed. Because what you call prayer and what I call prayer are probably two different things. Mm. What you call prayer is probably begging God. Mm. What I call prayer, you probably wouldn't call it prayer. You'd probably hear me pray and say, he never, he never when are you going to pray? <laughs> because prayer is just cooperation. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, now let's, let's get into the examples. All right, go, go to, let's look at salvation first. Go to... Are you interested in looking at this? Yes. All right, go to Acts 9. Do I have your attention? Yes. Some of you probably think, man, he, this man is crazy. <laughs> this man just told us don't pray for the sick. <laughs> I've never heard that. Are we in church? <laughs> this man said don't pray for the sick. Don't we have a sick and shut-in ministry? Ain't we supposed to go and pray for the sick and the shut-in? <laughs> what happens to the sick and the shut-in? Well, not in most churches. All right, let's go to this. Acts 10. All right, here we go. You ready? All right, now I'm going to, Acts chapter 10. I'm going to start in verse 1. Now I'm going to do some reading with you. Because you need to read the Bible. I don't trust you're going to be reading it at home anyway, so let's do it here. All right? I'm going to do some reading of some verses with you. Because there's a lot of nuggets that God's going to pull out here. Now watch this here. Acts chapter 10. And look at verse 1. I'm reading out of the King James. If you're not, that's fine. We'll end up in the same place anyway. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion, meaning he's a, a soldier, a general. He's over 100 soldiers, a century, where we get our word century, 100. He's a centurion, over 100 soldiers of the band called the Italian. So he's an, he's an Italian. He's a devout man. He feared God, respected God, and all of his house. 
He gave much alms to the people and he prayed to God always. Now he saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God. What did he see in his house? Angel. An angel. This is a big old angel sitting in this man's house. Now watch. Coming into him and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid. And he said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, your prayers and your alms are come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He will tell you what you should do. Didn't that angel know what to do? Didn't that angel know how to get saved? Didn't God know who sent the angel how to get saved? Why didn't God tell him what to do? See, when you read the Bible, you just read. You don't stop and think. Why didn't God tell him what to do? Answer me. Because he put it under your authority. When God tells us to do something, he is not going to do what he gave you the responsibility and authority to do. So he said, send for a man. Why did he say send for a man? Because men have been given that authority. It's the believer's authority. He told us to do it, to preach the gospel. When he told you to preach, he's not going to preach. Let's keep going. Verse 7, and when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed. So that angel just left. Mm -hmm. The guy's not saved. His family's not saved. We know it's God's will for every man to be saved. He's not willing for any to perish, but that all be what? Saved. This is God's will. But God's will does not come to pass without our cooperation. Amen. If you're thinking that the will of God for your life will just automatically come to pass, that's exactly what's stopping it from coming to pass. You have to cooperate. First, you have to know what God wants you to do, and then you have to start doing it. Let's keep reading. Verse 7, And when the angel which spake to Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Now on the morrow as they went in, on their journey and drew nigh to the city, Peter went up to the house to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and he would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending un unto him. And it had a great sheet knit together at the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Now, of course, they're Jews. So they're still under that law mindset and they had dietary laws. There were certain things they were forbidden to eat. So he's saying, I've never eaten this kind of food that's forbidden. You see? And so now he's telling him, look at this. He says, I want you to rise and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God has cleansed, call not thou common. This was done three times and the vessel was received up again to heaven. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And he called and asked whether Simon whose surname was Peter, was there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men seek you. Arise, therefore, and get down and go with them, and don't doubt anything, for I've sent them. Now let me help you understand something for a second. You need to learn something from this. That, ain't, that God stood in that man's house. And God's will for that man was that man 
be saved and his whole house be saved. But he needs men to work through. God has to work through men. He works through us, not independent of us. Something you need to learn. When you start in faith, when you start, let's say you're believing for a job, a promotion. Let's say you're believing for X amount of dollars to come in to pay for something. Let's say you, you, you speak to a sickness or a disease in your body. The moment you start to step out in God's will, just like Cornelius, that angel appeared to him. Now the will of God is in action, but it wasn't immediate. Because God was working on Peter. What you need to understand is that times when you are believing God for something, when you're trusting God for something, when you're in faith about something, what the devil's going to try to do is tell you it's not working. But listen to me. When the devil tells you it's not working, listen to me. God is speaking to Peter on your behalf. Amen. He's working it out. Now, you don't know what's happening. You don't know who Peter is. You've never seen him. You're not in his house. You don't know the conversation that God is. Do you don't know what God is doing, but you have to believe yes. the moment you step out in faith, the moment you speak to your problem, the moment you ask God for something, the moment you start trusting him for something that's consistent with his word and will for your life. Whether you see it or not, you have to trust that God is down in Simon the Tanner's house talking to Peter and telling him, stop doubting. He's working on it. He, the Holy Spirit is actively setting up the pieces to bring his will to pass in your life. And if you can stay in faith and not quit and keep trusting it will come to pass. This is why Jesus said when you pray, he said, whatsoever thing you desire when you pray, believe you receive them. When do you believe you receive them? When you pray. Then he said what? And you will have them. If you, you see what we do is we believe we receive when we have it, when we can see it, when we can touch it. But faith says, I believe when there is no evidence. And if you can believe that while you're sitting in your house, God is talking to Peter for your children. God is working on the dean at the school to approve the child to get into that college. God is working on the banker to approve the loan. When you speak to the sickness, yes, the, the, the x-ray may show it's still there, but God is slowly dissolving the lumps. When you trust him that no matter what you're seeing, it's working. If you'll stay in faith, it'll come to pass. You'll have it. But what the devil does is he tells you it's not working. It's not happening. God isn't doing anything. Look, the bills continue to rise up. The sickness is getting worse and worse. Look, the child is still, your son's still coming home every night, high as a kite, smoking that reefer. Nothing's happening. But you have to believe that God is working on your behalf. You have to believe that God is working in your job, in your career, in your business. He's working on your employer. He's working on your boss. He's creating the the the... He's setting the pieces to the puzzle for you to get to where he has you to go. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. Don't stop believing. What the devil does is, let me, say, let me tell you something. If the devil tells you anything, it's exactly the opposite of what's happening. Yes. Never forget that piece of information. Why? Because he's a liar. Right. Liars don't tell the truth. So if he tells you something, you know that it's not the truth. It's the direct. If he tells you you're going to die in three months, look at the x-ray. Then you know with long life you're satisfied. Amen. He's trying to talk you out of it to get you to leave your house because Peter's getting ready to come to your house. But if you go and Peter show up and you ain't there, then you missed out on it because you thought, well, that was a waste of time. I don't know where Peter is. But the whole time the healing's working. Y'all don't hear me in this place. The whole time when you start trusting God for a promotion, you see someone else get promoted over you and it doesn't look like it's happening. They may have even dropped your salary. Who knows? You got to believe that Peter's finna show up at your house because God is working on him. Are you with me? But the devil wants to tell you, leave your house. Peter never showing up. 
It's been four days. Keep trusting them. Somebody shout, keep believing. Keep believing. Keep believing. Amen. Keep believing. The Bible says that we inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. You know what patience is? You don't have a faith problem. Nobody in there has a faith problem. If you're born again, you have faith. You know what we have a problem with sometimes? Patience. You know what patience is? Patience does not mean to tolerate. That's how the world, that's the connotation the world gives. You're in traffic, they tell you be patient. You're in a long line, they tell you be patient. Don't get mad at the lady in front of you. Don't start beeping your horn. That's not patience. Patience literally means endurance. It means to stay the same. So let's say you start believing God for healing. Let's say you got a lump in your breast. You start believing God for healing. And you say, I'm, I'm, I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. But the lump starts growing. What does patience say? Faith says, I believe I'm healed. But what does patience say? When the lump continues to grow, you keep saying what? I'm healed. You don't change your confession. You stay consistent. The lump is continuing to grow. The doctor says it's getting worse and worse. What, are you, what, is, what does patience say? By his stripes, I'm healed, doc. Now, it keeps getting worse. You still feel it. What does patience do when, when, it, when the situation keeps getting worse? You say, I'm, I'm, I'm still trusting God. I believe. So it's not enough just to believe. You have to also have patience with your faith. Are you with me? Yes. All right. Now, let's keep reading. Watch this. What verse are we in? 21? Yes, 21. I just asked you that to make sure you're looking at your Bible and not over there thinking about, you know, what time the game comes on. All right, now watch this, 21. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius. And he said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man and one that feareth God and of good report among all nations of the Jews was warned from God by a holy angel to send for you in, into his house and to hear words of you. Then called he them in and lodged them. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet and worshiped him. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I also am a man. And he talked with him and he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, you know that it is unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God has showed me that I should not call any common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for. I asked, therefore, what intent you've sent for me. Verse 30. And Cornelius said four days ago, look at that. God showed up in his house four days earlier. It took four days. You know, we have this concept that there is no time or distance in the spirit. How many of you have heard that? That there is no time or distance in the spirit. Not necessarily. Who is to say that it doesn't take God time to do some things? See, right here, you have an example. God's standing there. It took four days. So just because you pray for something and it doesn't happen immediately. Like, let's say I pray for someone who's sick. And let's say, let's, say, let's say you're dealing with the sickness and you say, Pastor, can you pray for me? And I pray for you. And instantly you don't feel a change. You know what you're tempted to believe? It didn't work. We all are, right? Yes. We're tempted to believe that. But you can't prove that it's not working. Sometimes things take a little bit of time. What do we do? We stick with it. Are you with me? Yes. All right, now watch. Four days. Four days ago, I was, verse 30, fasting until this hour. And at the ninth hour, I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer is heard and your alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges in the house of Simon the Tanner by the seaside, who when he cometh will speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee and you have well done that you are come. Now, therefore, we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that feareth and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say unto you, you know, which was published throughout all Judah, Judea and began from Galilee. Uh, after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which we did both see in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, 
whom they slew and hung on a tree. Him God raised the third day and, sh and showed him openly. Not to all people, but unto certain witnesses who he chose before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach. What did he command us to do? Preach. Unto the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. Now, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. Now, what is the Holy Ghost? Go to your next, go to chapter one. You're going to understand this. You're going to walk in this. You're going to see power in your life. When you start rising up and doing your part, you're going to learn how to intelligently walk with God. There's no more of this wishing, hope, and wondering. God is mysterious. No more of this. You need to understand how to walk with God. While Peter spake, the Holy Ghost fell. While he spake, there was no giving of the Holy Ghost until he spoke. What is the Holy Ghost? Look at Acts chapter 1. You in chapter 1? Yes. Look at verse 8. Ready? Let's read it. I'm reading in the King James on 3. I want you to read out loud on 3. 1, 2, 3. And you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Who is the Holy Spirit? The power of God. When did the power of God go into motion? When did the power of God start working? While Peter spake. When Peter did what God told him to do, then the power of God fell. You know why the power of God isn't flowing in your life? Because you're not doing what God told you to do. The power of God did not flow until he did. While Peter spoke, the power of God did not fall in that house when the angels showed up. The power of God did not fall in that house when God showed up in, that, in Cornelius' house. The power of God only started flowing when, when Peter rose up and did what God told him to do, which was preach. When he obeyed God and did what God told him to do, then the power of God fell while he was speaking, while he was obeying God. It's the same for you. When you lay hands on the sick instead of asking God to heal the sick, the power of God will flow. When you speak to your mountain instead of asking God to move your mountain, the Bible told you to, he told you to speak to your mountain. You know what we do? We cry to God about our mountain. You should be crying to your mountain about what God has done. You should not be coming to God about how big your mountain is. You should be telling your mountain how big God is. Amen. When you do that while you speak, then the power of God will start flowing. But as long as you're glorifying the problem, as long as you're talking about how big the mountains are, how great the sickness is, what the doctor has said, what happened to Pookie in there, as long as you keep doing that, no power is going to flow. But the moment you start doing what he told you to do, with authority comes responsibility. When you respond with the ability that he entrusted and delegated to you, when you do it, then the power of God will flow. The Holy Spirit, God's power will flow in your life. The power to, to heal, the power to prosper. All of these things will start working when you, when you get busy doing what he told you to do. Do you understand that? Yes. Okay. Now, let me show you another example. Go to Acts 9. You're in 10. Flip back over to Acts 9. This one, these two are not going to be long at all. Acts 9. We have got to stop this. We have got to realize what we have, who we are, and how, and, and, and how to use it. The how to use it part is next week. But this part is vital that if he tells you to do something and you're not doing it, you're asking God to do it. You're fasting to try to get him to do it. You're, you're caught making a prayer chain. All of the things that we do to try to get God to what? Move. God's power moves when you take your responsibility and obey him. Amen. All right. Look at Acts 9. Watch this. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. People get nervous when I start at verse 1. Like, oh, God. We're going to read the whole, the whole Bible by the time we leave church today. Good for you. Now watch this, verse 1. 
And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus. Now, who is this Saul, who is later going to become who? Paul. Wouldn't you agree Paul is a great man? Wouldn't you agree that one, the, 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 one third of the New Testament was written by the Apostle Paul? Right. Didn't God need this man? Didn't God have a plan for this man? Yeah. Didn't God know his plan for it? Do you know Paul's life is prophesied in the Old Testament? His life is prophesied and God knew him before he was born. God knew you before you were born. Yeah. Your life has been prophesied before you got here. God doesn't, you don't get here and then all of a sudden God has to figure out how to use you. God already has a plan for you. Paul's life is prophesied in the Old Testament. You remember Jacob was blessing all 12 of his sons, right? And Benjamin showed up. He, got, he finally got around to Benjamin. He laid his hands on Benjamin. Remember that? Genesis 30. You probably don't, but just shake your head like, yeah, Pastor, I do remember. All right? All right. Genesis 30. He laid his hands on Benjamin and he prayed for Benjamin. Now, let me ask you, before we do this, what I, I already set you up, so get the question right. What tribe did Paul come from? The tribe of? It's simple, guys. Come on. Tribe of? Tribe of? Benjamin. Tribe of? Benjamin. Benjamin. Philippians chapter 3. He said, I'm from the tribe of Benjamin, an elite tribe. He's a Benjaminite. Now, follow me. When, 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 when uh, Jacob laid hands on Benjamin, what did he say? He said, Benjamin, he said, you are a, he said, you are a wolf. In the morning... You devour the sheep, but at night, you'll take share in the spoil, in the inheritance. What's the sheep? What's the flock? The church. What's the wolf? The enemy. What's the morning? The first part of your life. What's the night? The last part of your life. What do we see Paul doing from the tribe of Benjamin, the first part of his life? We're getting ready to read it in case you don't know. Devouring the church. What do we see him doing in the last part of his life? Taking share in the inheritance. God saw him. He saw you. God, the reason I'm telling you this is vitally important. God had a plan for Paul. But notice, I'm going to show you, Jesus is standing right in front of Paul, and yet God, Jesus doesn't tell him anything or do anything for him or even, you're going to see healing here. He doesn't even heal him. But he tells him to send for a man. He sends a man to him. Why? Because he gave us authority. Wow. Let's keep reading. Watch this. This is going to help you. Look at this. Is everyone with me so far? Yes. All right. Watch this. Verse one. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and he desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if you found any of this way, that's what Christians were called until Acts 13. They were called. Uh, the way Christianity was called the way because Jesus said, I am the truth, the life and the way, way. it wasn't called Christianity until Acts 13 in uh, 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 in the church um, that Paul was over. Now, look at this verse two. And he desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if you found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And he journeyed and came near Damascus and suddenly there shot round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am who? Jesus. Who's standing in front of him? Jesus. Jesus. He said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said, go into the city. Get up and it will be told you what you must do. Didn't the Lord know what he had planned for Paul to do? Yes. Yes. The Lord is this is this is not an angel now, Brandy. Jesus himself is standing in front of Paul. Yes. Didn't he know what he planned for him? Yes. Didn't he know what he wanted him to do? Yes. Why didn't he tell him? Let's keep reading it because it won't hit you until we see this. Watch this. And the men. Which were and, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth. And when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight. When, don't, don't you think he needs healing? Yes. He can't see. He got a vision problem. 
Someone says, well, how did he get a vision problem? If you looked into the sun, if you looked at a solar eclipse, they, remember we just had the eclipse. They told, what they tell you? Don't look at, don't look at it. Mm -hmm. It caused blindness. I can guarantee you if you see the glory of Jesus is brighter than any solar eclipse. In fact, if you read Acts 26, it tells you he was blinded because he saw the glory of the light of Jesus. Yes. So his, his eye, he, it's like cataracts came on his eyes instantly. When he saw that light, it blinded him. Now watch, let's keep reading. Verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Anani. Now pay attention here. I'm almost done. I'm going to let you out of here. Just pay, stay with me. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. What's his name? And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Behold, he is praying. He has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Why didn't the Lord heal his eyes right there when he's in front of him? This is, all right, don't steal my thunder, Brandon. Give me a second, all right? This is, Je no, pay attention. This is Jesus, not an angel this time. Jesus, the one who walked the shores of Galilee and opened eyes of the blind. We know he can do it. Why didn't he do it there? Because he delegated that authority to us in Mark 16, and he went and sat down. Now it's up to you. Even though he has the power to heal, when he was physically here on the earth, he healed the sick. But now we are his body. And if people are going to get healed, he has to work through his people, through those who he delegated that authority to. Are you with me? Yes. So Jesus is standing right in front of the man. The man got a vision problem. The man can't see. And Jesus standing right there did not heal his eyes. Why not? Because he gave that authority to you. He told us to go lay hands on the sick and they will what? They will what? He did not say, I'm going to do it. He told you to do it. So when he told you, when God gives you, let me calm down. <laughs> when God delegates authority to you, it limits what he himself will do. Wow. If you can get that statement, when, let me say it another way. When God tells you to do something, yeah. he will not do. What he told you to do. Uh -huh. If God told you to heal the sick and you pray, God, heal my mom, she will die. Yeah. This is not a laughing matter. Uh -huh. this, is why the this is why the church is confused. Yeah. So when something happened, the preacher doesn't know what happened. So all he's left to say is the Lord needed another flower in heaven because I can't figure out why it happened. The reason it's happening is because you cannot tell God or ask God to do something that he had told you to do. He said they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He is not going to heal Paul's eyes. Why? Because he delegated that responsibility to his church. If the church now turns back and says, God, heal. He's looking at you saying, I told you to do it in my name. It's my power, but you have to do it. Amen. 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 Can you see the man has no sight? He said, I, I'm sent Ananias. Get up. Ananias is watching the game. He says, Ananias, he says, what's up, Lord? He says, I need you to go. I showed this man named Saul that you are coming to him. To lay your hand on him that he might receive it. Jesus is, he saw that the man was blind. Yeah. Why didn't he hear? See, many of you think, well, if the Lord were to show up, I'd be, if Jesus was right here, you'd still have the same sicknesses you have today. Yeah. Ooh, you'd still be in the same poverty that you're dealing with today. You'd still be dealing with the same. Why? Because he uses people. And until you start cooperating yeah. with him, that power will not start working. Mm. My God. That's what I'm going to teach you next week. How do you cooperate? Yeah. Jesus can be physically in front of you. Let me tell you something. Whether you see him or not, the Lord is with you. Amen. Angels are in this place. The Lord is in this place right now. Yeah. But why is he not impacting us? Why do we not have sight? Why are we, our marriages falling apart? Why are we struggling financially? Why are we sick? Because you do not know how to cooperate. Ooh, you are begging God to do things that he put under your authority. 
It's under your authority, church. It's under your authority. It's when he tells you to do it, he cannot do it. Amen. He gave you the responsibility. He's not going to do it. Amen. This is what you have to get. The church did not tell you this. No. The church did not teach you this. They taught you. They taught you. You're nothing. Cry out. And ask God, and maybe he will, but sometimes he won't. Sometimes it's yes, and sometimes it's no. The Bible says all the promises of God are yes and amen. It does not say, Paul said, I never preached. Jesus says yes and no. 1 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians one twenty. read it for yourself. He says, I never preached Jesus as yes and no. The world, the church preaches him that way. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. Paul said, God, Jesus, all the promises of God, as long as it's consistent with the Bible, all the promises of God are yes. Not yes and no. Yes and amen. All the, if you can find it in the book, he says yes. yes. Never wavers between yes and no. But the church has filled our lives with bull. Yeah. And that's why we have no results. And the world mocks us. But man, I'm trying to raise up a people that know their God. I'm trying to raise up a people that can do great exploits. I'm trying to raise up a people that know how to methodically and intelligently, yeah. not this weird church craziness. Right. You know what I'm talking about? It's like weirdos. It's like, no, I'm not going there, mama. It's like, no, come to church. No, they weird. You've been brainwashed. And there's no power flowing. No power. You ain't had to tell me. No power flowing. We're in debt. We're sick. We're poor. You know Jesus gave you the power to get wealth? Amen. That's what the word says. That's what the word says. Yes. He gave you power to heal the sick. And he gave you power to get wealth. Health and wealth. Yes. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper. That's, that's wealth. And what? Be in health. But how does it come? Even as your soul prosper. You got to know something. And you're so busy trying to pursue this and pursue that. The reason you're sick, the reason you're poor is because you don't know enough. Amen. But I know too much to be sick. Amen. I know too much to be poor. Amen. I know too much to be brought down. I don't care what the world says. I don't care how they raise their eyes. I don't care what they think. I don't care what you think. I ain't scared of you. Amen. Amen. I'm telling you, you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And the moment you get the word of God, the truth of God's word, it will free you to live in God's will for your life. Amen. 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 The Bible says in Psalm 138 that when he brought the children of Israel out. Remember, there were 10 plagues. Nine of them didn't work. Only the 10th one worked. Remember? And what was the 10th one? The Passover lamb. Church, our Passover lamb, the true one, has been slain. The real Passover lamb, the lamb of God has been slain for the sins of the world and you've received him. His blood is on your doorpost. Amen. And when he brought them out, the Bible says he brought them out with two things. What two things? Do you know? That's your problem. What? Yeah, go ahead, sister, say it. Silver and gold and not one feeble, one sick among them. We see him bringing them out with what? Silver and gold. That's wealth. And not one person sick among them under a shadow of the true lamb under a type of the true lamb. they didn't even have a real lamb they had a lamb out the backyard you got the real lamb the son of god and you let people talk you out of what rightfully belongs to you Jesus. he brought you out not, there's not supposed to be one feeble one sick one poor one disease in this church Hallelujah. you ought to say amen amen it's talking about you. Amen. 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 Watch this. Let's keep reading. Look at this. Verse 11. No, we read that. Verse 13. And Ananias answered, 
Lord, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And I hear that he has authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on your name. And the Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel unto me to, to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And I'm going to show him great things. He must suffer. And Ananias went his way. And to the, he did what? He went. See, when you're in your house and, 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 and see, you're, you're Ananias is on the way. What I'm trying to tell you is, see, God is working on it. The moment you do what God tells you to do, he told him, go into the city. What did Paul do? He went. And while you're going, God is speaking to an Ananias. He's speaking to a Peter. God is working on things when you can't tell it's, it's happening. He's doing it. Stay in faith. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Now watch this. And so and Ananias went his way, entered into the house. And what did he do? What did he do? He put his what? What did Jesus tell us to do in Mark 16, 15? Believers do what? Lay hands. What is he doing? He's doing what God told him to do. He's not praying and asking God to heal Paul's eyes. You are praying that way. The, the Bible doesn't tell you to do that. He went in, look at this, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared to thee in the way as you came, sent me. He sent me. For what purpose? That you might receive your sight. He sent a man so that another man could receive his sight. Jesus standing right there did not give sight to Paul. Why? Because he told us to lay hands. So what did, what did Ananias do? He went in, he obeyed. He did what God told him to do. He put his hand. And he said in the name of Jesus, brother Saul, I'm sure hoping you're a brother. I'm sure hoping you ain't finna kill me. He was scared. That's why it took three days. God spoke to him immediately. But see, let me, I'm going to get to this when we start talking about how to pray. See, when you, you need to believe God that the, the people who God is speaking to would, be, would, would respond quickly. You need to pray people loose. That's how you pray. You're not sitting there, oh, God. Dude, God is working. He's talking. But, but the Satan is also talking. And which one are they going to believe? It's like the, the picture of the angel and the devil. And God is speaking to someone about your promotion, speaking to someone about your business to start buying your product, speaking to someone to get to, to, to make a way, speaking to the banker to approve your law. But the devil's trying to stop it. And you, what you need to do is you need to start learning how to pray against the enemy trying to keep the people from obeying God. Because God has to use a person. Are you with me? All right. And so it took three days, not because it took God three days, but it took three days because he was worried. He telling God, God, I heard about this man. We read it in a few verses, but the Bible tells you it took three days. He was going back and forth like you do. Right. Don't read these people like they're holier than you. They doubted like you doubted. They worried like you worried. They, this, this man has authority to kill anybody who's a Christian. And God tells him to go to his house. <laughs> Don't read this like a Bible story. How would you respond? God tell you, I want you to go to Bin Laden's house. <laughs> like, that's not Jesus. This is the devil. I bind you, Satan, like sister did, in the name of Jesus. That's the devil. That's not God trying to take my life, Satan. So you need to be praying that people can what? Discern the voice of God. Are you with me? And so Ananias showed up. He put his hand on him. The man received his sight. Why didn't Jesus... Give him the sight right there. Guys, this is Jesus. Do you, how many of y'all know Jesus is the same yeah. yesterday, today, and forever? Yeah. What he did right there, he's still doing today. You know why you don't have your healing? Because you're asking God instead of doing what he told you to do. Amen. You know why you don't have your prosperity? Because you're asking God instead of doing what he told you to do. Amen. What did he tell you to do? Go. Go. No, when it comes to finances, what did he tell Go. you to do? <laughs> See, it gets quiet. Don't worry, I'll leave you alone. I'll come back next week. You need to obey what he's telling you. He told you tithe. He told you bring a tenth of your income. Put him first in your income. If you do, he said, I'll open the window of heaven and pour out blessing. You're praying, oh, God, please help me come through. You're doing what he told you not to do. You think that the church is running. Now, there are churches running the game on you. But listen to me. I'm, listen, I want to see you do well in life. I'm telling I can't. I don't know how to convince. I don't. Guys. 
when I tell you what I'm telling you is for your own good. Yeah. But that's, that's the point, though. Like, we, like, you tell us, we start doing what you say once, like, let's say, I'll use myself as an example. I've been tithing for over a year, and things have happened. Testify. Yes. So we will go. Amen. They, you're going you're gonna to get it. I, you may not get it today, but it's, God is chipping away. But see, when God tells you to do something, he's t it's for, God doesn't need your money. God doesn't need your money. Yeah. Let me tell you something else. I don't need your money. I was in there before you ever got here. Yeah. I don't need your money. I didn't open the church for your money. I got my own money. I got, mo I got money on man. <laughs> man. Don't even let me start. Don't even let me start. I don't need anything from you. I'm trying to get something to you. And you need to follow a man who knows the way. You need to follow a man with a proven track record. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm trying to help you. Amen. 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 When we do what he tells us to do, then things will work. Amen. Amen. All right. I had one more for you, but, you know, I know you're probably done by now. You can stop me anytime you want. Just, you know, let me know. Y'all like, no, we ain't finna stop you. Next week, I'm going to show you how you use it. Amen. So we're going to start. You're ready, right? But did you get today? What is today? With authority. Comes responsibility. You cannot ask, fill in the blank, God. to do what he told you to do. Can you see it in the Bible? Yes. And we use salvation, which is the highest order. Yes. And you know, if he dealt, we use healing too. I'm going to show you more examples. Right. Uh, or next week when I show you how to use it, you're going to see other examples as we go in the series. But can you see the principle that I'm yes. trying to get to you? Yes. That if God tells you to do it, when he told you to lay hands on the sick, and Ananias did not show up in his house and say, okay, first of all, Facebook, all right, I'm going over at P Paul's house. All right, pray for Paul because he can't see anymore, y'all. Okay, now I'm going into Paul's house, and they take pictures of Paul. You know, his eyes are bandaged up. All right, look at Paul now. Okay, y'all praying, right? All right, now I'm going to get on WhatsApp. I'm going to call my kid folks down in Jamaica, down in the Bahamas, down in I'm going to call everybody, and we're going to get on a prayer chain. And then I'm going to come in here now and then we're going to pray for Brother Paul and Paul's Paul going to be all right because y'all been praying. Nope. Did Daddy, did he do that? No. He did what he told, what Jesus told him to do. What did he do? He go in, yeah. he laid hands. Paul, receive your sight. And what happened? The Bible says immediately, scales. It was a, I, I believe, you know what I believe? It says scales. You know what I believe it was? What? Cataracts. <laughs> a cataracts. Yeah, right. yeah. You, see, you ever see a cataract come out? It looks like a scale. Because you're instantly blinded, his eyes clouded up. Instantly, it reacted to the light. Just like if you were to look at the uh, eclipse, instantly you go blind, a cataracts. So the cataracts fell. Wow. The Bible says he saw scales fall on the ground. Yeah. Instantly. But nothing happened until he what? Did what God told him to do. He did not pray and say, God, heal. Amen. What? All right, ask me after. Ask me after. Okay. Ask me after. I don't want to hold the people. I got a baby dedication to do anyway. <laughs> but, but. Can, I just want to make sure before y'all leave here, Amen. I know that I'm saying things that are not traditionally taught, True. but if you can do me a favor, if you can understand and see what I'm saying, just hold your hand up, please. Amen. 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 Okay. All right, great. Let's start using our authority. Amen. Amen. That's next week, how to do it, okay? All right, so come back next week, Amen.